Courtroom for the Martin Luther King Commission 28th anniversary. How are you doing, Ms. Daniels? Ms. Abram? <laughs> I'm fine, I'm fine. That's okay. Uh, well, number one is I've made some gaps because I'm 89 years old. I was born in 1931, and that was during the Depression. And that was a period when there was a lot of migration going on. And people from the rules were moving to the urban, both blacks and whites. And of course, blacks were moving to Little Rock, which was the capital of the state of Arkansas. And the capital had moved from Washington, Arkansas, down in the Delta. So when we talk about this 28th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's commission, that's interesting always to me because I was born in 1931 and he was born in 1929. So we grew up in the same historical era of the United States. And so in studying United States history, it's based on other countries' history. And the slaves and their descendants, history comes out of Africa. And today we call ourselves African Americans because we are both of our ancestry in Africa and our legal and civic recognition by the laws of America as Arkansans. So when the 28th anniversary came around, that's a quarter of a century plus three. A century is 100 years, quarter is 25. 25 plus three is 28. So you have to get an understanding of what time is it on history's clock. Well, at that time, we had come a long ways from the Emancipation Proclamation, the freeing of slaves, we had come away from the 13th Amendment of women having the right to vote. And as an activist, one of the things that I'm known as, and that's why you're in the Mother Anna Abrams Museum and Historic Library, is I have a lot of history here in my home where I live and been here since 1968. But 28 years ago, because I had been known as, which is on the front page of the Arkansas Times, and this one of the few times at that time that blacks were on the front page of the Arkansas Times magazine. And this is the cover, and this is me, and it says, Little Rock has Annie. And if you want black history, Annie has lived it. And I have lived here in Little Rock when I came to go to school to Paul Lawrence Dunbar, named after a black poet. And it's interesting that here on our 28th year, yesterday was the inauguration of a president that we had a young woman to be a poet, to have the inaugural poem. And that's important because Paul Lawrence Dunbar was a poet that was recognized. And what we did as African descendants, we tried to write history in the naming of things that were part of our legacy or our history. Legacy of a family, legacy of a church, legacy of a community. And so today I am to discuss with you all on the video the legacy of West Ninth Street. And because I've known as a historian but also as an activist, that is, you're still fighting 
discrimination and civil rights in this country. I've helped a lot of people write books. I haven't written my own, but I'm trying to get through and have it ready by my 90th birthday. But I've served here in the same room, my living room, to help a young woman write the history of 9th Street. The name of the book is End of the Line, which is a history of Little Rock's West 9th Street. And it's by Bernie J. Love. I had introduced a book that I was interviewed many, many, many times because I am known as black history in the city and period. And so that's my authenticity. And the rest of my authenticity is I was a charter member of the Martin Luther King Commission when it was established and I was appointed by the governor, William Jefferson Clinton. I want to read to you uh, from this book, I think that would help everybody, and you can get the book. It's available uh, at Barnes & Noble, at uh, all of the bookstores that try to have black history part of their inventory. But this is what this book says. The line was more than a street. The book is the end of the line. West 9th Street, known to locals as the line, was a boundary that separated Little Rock's blacks and white societies. It was an artery of the city, a thoroughfare, east and west, and a hive of activity, businesses, religious institutions, and a lot of entertainment. But notably, it was the heart of the black community. Its history began long before official Jim Crow laws enforced rigid restrictions between black and white relations in Arkansas and in the South. The West 9th Street community sprang from a log shanty town erected by the Federal Army to house former slaves who flooded Little Rock after emancipation. By the early 20th century, West 9th Street was developing into a strong commercial district, predominantly owned and operated by blacks. Whites ran businesses there and lived in mixed-in neighborhoods in the area. But by the 1920s, 9th Street was securely established as the civic, social, and commercial center of Little Rock's black population. But prejudice and fear cut short success and security for the capital's black people. After the lynching of John Carter on the corner of Broadway and 9th Street in 1927, many blacks fled and black-owned businesses folded, carrying hope for tolerance and aspirations for better educational and economic opportunities. Many Arkansas's black refugees followed the great mi migration north to big cities like Chicago and Detroit. As I said, Martin Luther King was born in 1929 when the Great Depression gripped America. It gripped the line with 9th Street. Many of the street's black entrepreneurs and professionals suffered failure and bankruptcy. World War II revived the street and its community, and it took on a new role as a safe haven 
and playground for black soldiers. During its heyday, 9th Street in the 40s, 1940, never slept. It resembled a little like Harlem in New York, vibrant with music, money, girls, and good meals. 9th Street would never have the same sense of excitement and community again. During this renaissance, 9th Street heard a new tune, progressiveness. Equality played in every heart of every black citizen in the United States. Old rules were challenged and civil rights victories lifted the color barrier in many industries. Equalized pay for black educators and struck white only from the Democratic Party. Ninth Street was always a microcosm of change. Anything that affected black affected the street community. West Ninth Street stood witness to the tearing down of the walls of segregation and the new progress, the new and old ideas of blacks and whites living and working side by side as equal. The revolution in Arkansas ushered in integration. And now the question was, could a black business enclave that once served a segregated audience continue to serve a desegregated one? By the 1960s, the street community was 100 years old. And like the toiletry, old man it was, it showed its age. Before the passing, in the 1970s, West Ninth Street had become an eyesore. West Ninth Street wasn't about bricks, boards, and mortar. It was about a people who saw a better world for themselves. The line, as Ninth Street was known, was the stage upon which we can now see the greatest drama of the 20th century, the greatest Finale, the emancipation of a people, a look at societal events, area histories, and personal perspectives reveal a myriad of factors that contributed to West Ninth Street's glorious heyday and its final years of withering away. Ready for next? Tell us, give us a little insight about your your personal experiences from Ninth Street. Did you did you did yes. you spend time mm -hmm. on Ninth Street? Okay. Number one, as I shared with you from the book, the line, and the line also referred to that's where the bus ended at twelve o'clock, <laughs> and if you didn't catch that twelve o'clock bus, you were subject to be arrested on 9th Street. Uh, for 9th Street, as I said, that's where we went to eat. That's where we went to get our hair done. That's where we went to the funeral homes that were owned by blacks. That was right off of 10th Street where the blacks were birthed. You birthed right off of 9th Street, and you were penalized from right off 9th Street. That were the film homes. But also on 9th and Broadway where the black man, Mr. Carter, had been lynched, was the development of a business compound, kind of like Dillard's, kind of like uh, Walmart. It was known as the Mosaic Templars, which was a convention center. It was a place where doctors and black doctors and lawyers had their businesses. And there was fraternal orders. 
And that building is still there on Ninth and Broadway. On Ninth Street was the movie theaters, just like any other business district during the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Well, it was in the 49, 49, 50, well, 40, I start working at 47. 47, 48, 49, and 50. I worked at the gym theater, the movie theater. And that was where I had one of my first public jobs. I also went to the churches on 9th Street or right off 9th Street, which are known as a historic district. And in this book, in my library, I have the National Register of Historic Places, African American Historic Places. And some of the street, some of the churches and some of the uh, buildings are on the historic roster uh, in this book. So when you say Ninth nice Street, what, what span did it run? Because when I think of Ninth Street, coming up in my age group, we think of Ninth Street as the east end, east side of Little Rock. What, 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 so exactly, what, what was the span? Where? Okay, you mean what was the boundary? Yes, ma'am. Okay, streets in Little Rock were numbered from north to south. First Street was not a known, known street, but that was the street now where the convention center is on. Okay. Then the numbers get larger as you go south. So Markham, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. And that was, that's, it's north and south. But Ninth Street had, Ninth Street had an open in and a closed in. It went all the way across town at that time. And Ninth and High and Ninth and Broadway is where the majority of the blacks who were the class called educated people. And the educated people were the ones who were teachers, lawyers, doctors, morticians, and beauticians, and barbers, and seamstress. Reverend J.C. Crenshaw, whose son went to Tuskegee and was the first to know how to fly a plane and became famous, he grew up on 9th Street in his daddy's shop where he learned to be a tailor, make men's suits that were so the ninth street that you're speaking of was pretty much what we know as the downtown area. Well, downtown is considered downtown from ninth to going east. Mm -hmm. Here you get again ninth, eighth, seventh, sixth street, fifth is capital, mm -hmm. and then you have fourth, third second, and that was going east. When you got to east, that was the industrial area. And that's where you had factories. Yeah, okay. And so the east end was considered the places where the less educated lived. The poverty line was in east of Main Street. And the center of the street between 9th Street and 12th Street, you had an evolution of black communities and white communities emerging. But 9th Street itself kept its name, 9th Street, going from east to west until the lynching. And with that lynching going in 
newspapers all over the country. The white people living on 9th Street, from High Street, which is now Martin Luther King, didn't want nobody to know they lived on 9th Street where they lynched. And so they changed the name of 9th Street from High Street to the west as far as our city went. And it was called Maryland Avenue. Maryland Avenue. Not that old Ninth Street. And because Ninth Street after the war went down economically, it became a victim of urban renewal. And urban renewal was where we began to see the advancement of car transportation, taking people west of Maine and east of Maine were going to the places where blacks lived, poor blacks, uneducated blacks primarily. And west of that intersection that became Maryland Avenue was where the white churches were. And the church, whether it's a white community, a black community, a Hispanic community, helps determine the culture and the value system. So 9th Street had some of the oldest churches, either right on 9th Street or a block or two away, like Mount Zion Baptist Church, like the Episcopalian Church that was the white Episcopalian. And of course, Bethel AME, Bethel African American Episcopal, was a part of the African church that split off from the United Methodist Church, which was the white church. And 9th Street Bethel Church people were copies of Mother Bethel, Big Bethel, in the north. And as a result of that, Big Bethel in Little Rock was the place where the man who was lynched, Mr. Carter, that the white Ku Klux Klans at that period went into Bethel A.M.E. Church, which is now on 16th and State, and took their pews in the church, took axes, and chopped up the pews, and made a fire, and burned the body of the lynched man that they had hung, who had been accused that he had molested a little white girl. That too helped to kill West 9th Street. Okay. The lynching, the Industrial Revolution, the Depression, the urban renewal, all of those. But as it relates to Dr. Martin Luther King and our 28th anniversary of the establishment of a commission, we had had the Urban League, which is over 100 years. We had had the NAACP, which was an old civil rights that was fighting after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed into law by Abraham Lincoln. And as a result of that, the governors, of Arkansas have always established commissions and boards and the governor has always appointed them. So you ask me about my relationship to employment and socialization on 9th Street because of that history and involvement, I became an 
activists within the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party was moving from, because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, was moving from a Republican dominated community to a Democratic. And so my relationship to the Martin Luther King Commission was William Jefferson Clinton established the Martin Luther King Commission, which had a mission, goals and objectives to the legacy of Dr. King's civil rights legacy. And as a result of him establishing that commission, the Martin Luther King Commission of Arkansas, I was a charter member. Charter member means you were one of the first. That's my relationship to the Martin Luther King Commission established 28 years ago, my relationship to 9th Street, and my relationship today. I belong still as a commissioner for the urban, for the Martin Luther King, and a member of the Urban League, and a life member of the NAACP. So my activism is what made me be a historian of black evolution, not only on 9th Street, but in Little Rock, in Arkansas, in this country, and all the way back to Africa when I went to Ghana, where the pyramids are. And so that's my history. But the thing that is important is that we have to continue to fight for the history to be recorded and taught of our racial identity. And so as a result of that, I'm not only known as an activist for civil and human rights, but I'm also known as an activist for preservation of history. And one of the books in my museum and library is this book, The National Register of Historic Places, African American Historic Places. And in this book are the places that have been fought for to be preserved so that our existence and our legacies would not. But like any other history, you always have those who were the first. I've been a charter member of the Democratic Black Caucus, of which I nominated the director of the Martin Luther King Commission Deshaun Scarborough to get the Annie Abrams Award that is given to somebody who demonstrates my philosophy. Service, community service, is the rent you pay to stay on God's earth. When you see me committing and becoming an activist, I'm just paying some rent so that I won't be evicted from heaven for staying on God's earth. That saying, I'm just paying some rent, was adopted also by Shirley Chisholm, a activist who was the first woman to run for president of the United States. And Cassius Clay, who changed during the Vietnam War to the name of Cassius Clay became <laughs> Muhammad, Ali. Muhammad Ali, yes, I'm 89. <laughs> and I remember that I was walking down the streets at a convention in New York when 
about a month after he had changed his name. And my secretary was with me, and I looked and I saw him. And he had said, thing like a bee and all those things that he was known for. And I said, look at that, there comes Cassius Clay. And I stopped and I said, Cassius Clay! And by that time, he was walking toward where I was, and he walked a little faster, and he said, I am not Cassius Clay. I am Muhammad Ali. I said, boy, you knew who I was talking to when I said Cassius Clay. And so our names and our identities are changed and reflected based on what we did that made history. The last book I have here in my library, it lists African Americans who were first. And that book with photographs has people who have like Ms. Mc Mary McLeod, Bethune, and others. African Americans Who Were First by Joan Potter and Constance Claytar. What does it take to be the best, to be the very first? Many African Americans dare to succeed, often in the face of overwhelming odds. Their contributions and achievements are part of America's history and deserve to be known more widely. In this book, there are stories of African Americans who did it first in a variety of fields, from medicine to politics, from sports to the entertainment world. Moses Fleetwood Walker was the first African American to play Major League Baseball. Bessie Coleman was the first African American woman to earn a pilot's license. And Hattie McDaniel was the first to win an Oscar. Some of the names will be unfamiliar. Discover the black heritage of courage and achievement passed on by both famous and little known men and women. So as we celebrate our 28th anniversary, birthday, how long we've been around, there are others, historic lessons that have been taught. Because I've been around and a charter member of the Martin Luther King, every celebration that we have, it may start with the legacy of Martin Luther King himself. It may be it's because of the Martin Luther King Federal Historic uh, Commission. It no longer exists because of the evolution of how far we've come. And now I always end. As I talk about where we started, where we are, or where we're going to be, I always end with, where do we go from here? I'm proud that I've been a part of celebrating, and I have over a hundred t-shirts celebrating how long it's been since we integrated Central High School in 1957, how long it's been since we started the NAACP, how long it's been since we started the Urban League, how long it's been since we had the first Congressional Black Caucus of Blacks in Congress. But the most important thing is legacies and histories are celebrated for the purpose of carrying on the legacy by teaching the history.
No, with that being said, we have one more talking point. Okay, what's another the course last talking, talking the about? The last talking point is uh, your relationship with Daisy Bates and then her relationship to Martin Luther King. Okay. Um, Daisy, Bates Daisy Bates was the wife of Elsie Bates. And Elsie and Daisy had a newspaper, a black newspaper that was the voice of the black community that was there on Ninth Street between State and Izzet. And that paper was the voice of two activists. And as a result of that, the paper was the thing that was almost the same thing as an allegation of you harassed a little white girl, so you need to die. The state press, and i get a copy of it in there that I have, the Arkansas State Press was the most well-known black paper outside of Chicago and the Chicago Defender or the New York Amsterdam black paper. And because of the laws of segregation and the civil disobedience that we were accused of as black people, decisions were made to, de to demolish the black press. And the black press, like the Arkansas Democrat Gazette today, New York Times, Washington Post in Washington, D.C., depends upon commercials in the paper. And subscriptions are just a part. The subscriptions are when people subscribe contract to have it delivered to their home or to their mail box. And so just like they lynched Mr. Carter, just like they sued the black businesses on North on uh, West Ninth and other black communities that had been there demolished the value of their homes and their businesses. That's what happened. And so as a result of that, Daisy Bates, before the demolish of their paper, became the surrogate mother. She was so proud she wouldn't be called Mother Abrams, I mean Mother Bates. Like I'm, I'm proud that people call me Mother Abrams just like they called Mother Teresa, who spoke up for the poor in India. I knew Daisy. I knew Elsie. My boys, my four little children, were paper boys that sold the Arkansas State Press in the black community. But I remember before they bought the house on 28th Street, which is a museum on the National Register of Historic Places, that Daisy and L.C. lived over near Arkansas Baptist College, which its administrative building is on the National Register of Historic Places, that they rented and lived in a duplex and as a result of that, they had a squirrel that they had tamed like you tame a cat. And since we couldn't go to the zoo as black children, lots of people loved to go over and watch Mr. and Mrs. Bates' tamed pit. And then after 1957, and she was the surrogate mother of the Little Rock Nine, which you'll see all on my walls in there. She and Elsie bought the house on 28th. But they were still suffering from the cruelty 
of boycotting by white America in Little Rock. They were about to lose that house. And it was purchased by the Ministerial Alliance, the black one. And it is still there. And it became a member of the historic sites, places that are historic sites in America. And she and our LC live to be a part of the Martin Luther King Commission. But I've known all of the directors like Deshaun, but each one was strengthened by their previous predecessor. Uh, so did you or Miss Bates have any, any action with Martin Luther King when he visited here? Oh yes, when Martin Luther King came to Ernie Green's, the first black of the Little Rock Nine, to graduate. Dr. King came in disguise with glasses on, hats, and all of that, so that they would not molest him, kill him, whatever they wanted to do. Because he was known by that time as a national and a international leader. And as a result of that, he stayed at Elsie and Daisy's home. And I have pictures of the bedspread, which was a chenille bedspread with a peacock on it, that he stayed in. Here's a book that I've made uh, a piece of the archives. Daisy Gaston Bates Memorabilia. And that's Daisy when she was beautiful teenager, young teenager, she wasn't a college student. So I have this book. This notebook belongs to Annie McDaniel Abrams. And I had this on display at the Martin, at the Daisy Bates Museum, where people could see. But the purpose of having and developing this Daisy Bates memorabilia was it was to be a fundraiser to help pay the gas, water, and lights. Because that was something I didn't want to ever happen, that they would cut the lights off or the gas off because Daisy couldn't pay it, or the Ministerial Alliance wouldn't pay it. So there have been members of the Ministerial Alliance, and then when it came a part of the National Historic Sites, and people have come from all over the world to stop by that museum. So it pays for somebody somebody to respect, love, and be proud to be identified with a personality or an institution. And so I'm proud to have been a member of the Martin Luther King Commission for 28 years.